So the reading is Titus 1, starting at verse 5. The reason I left you in Crete was that you might put in order what was left unfinished and appoint elders in every town as I directed you. An elder must be blameless, faithful to his wife, a man whose children believe and are not open to the charge of being wild and disobedient. Since an overseer manages God's household, he must be blameless, not overbearing, not quick-tempered, not given to drunkenness, not violent, not pursuing dishonest gain. Rather, he must be hospitable, one who loves what is good, who is self-controlled, upright, holy and disciplined. He must hold firmly to the trustworthy message as it has been taught so that he can encourage others by sound doctrine and refute those who oppose it. For there are many rebellious people, full of meaningless talk and deception, especially those of the circumcision group. They must be silenced, because they are disrupting whole households by teaching things they ought not to teach, and that for the sake of dishonest gain. One of Crete's own prophets has said it. Cretans are always liars, evil brutes, lazy gluttons. This saying is true. Therefore rebuke them sharply so that they will be sound in the faith and will pay no attention to Jewish myths or to the merely human commands of those who reject the truth. To the pure, all things are pure. But to those who are corrupted and do not believe, nothing is pure. In fact, both their minds and consciences are corrupted. They claim to know God, but by their actions they deny him. They are detestable, disobedient, and unfit for doing anything good. Heavenly Father, we pray, please, would you teach us this evening? We pray that you might be at work in our hearts by your Holy Spirit. We pray that you would impress upon us the truth and that through that you might transform us to be more and more like the Lord Jesus. And we pray this in his name. Amen. Reaching even Crete for Christ. Um, I guess if Paul were into giving his letters titles, uh, this could be it for Titus. Reaching even Crete for Christ. I mentioned last week, if you were with us, that Crete was a fundamentally dysfunctional society. Um, a haven for pirates. Um, um, notorious for violence and full of lies and deception. Um, So much so, in fact, that in the ancient world, world, to crete became a verb meaning to lie. Such was its reputation for deception. And last week we thought about the question, how do you transform a fundamentally dysfunctional place like Crete? How do you reach even Crete for Christ? How do you make even Cretans Christ-like? And last week we saw Paul's key principle in that mission. It's the truth that that transforms. Paul talked about the knowledge of the truth that leads to godliness. That is, knowing the truth of the gospel is the thing that has got the power to transform people and even Cretans. And in today's passage, Paul applies that principle, outlining for us stage one of reaching even Crete for Christ. What is stage one of Paul's great strategy and plan? Well, we see it in verse five. Paul says, the reason I left you, Timothy, and left you, Titus, in Crete, was that you might put in order what was left unfinished and appoint elders in every town as I directed you. Stage one of reaching even Crete for Christ, appoint elders. Now, I don't know about you, but to me, that feels a little bit of a come down. Um, Paul's great purpose for Crete is exciting and inspiring, bringing transformational transformation to an evil place. That is wonderful. Uh, Nikki Cruz, you may know that name, one of the most feared gang leaders in New, New York, becomes a Christian. Wonderful story. That is amazing. 
reading about the various revivals that happened in our recent, not so distant history in the British Isles. Um, reading about how in some places, pubs had to close down because their most prolific drinkers had all become Christians. That is amazing. That is transformation of a place. The gospel bringing life. But appointing elders, well, next to that kind of level of transformation, it can just feel a bit functional. Um, dare I even say it, kind of bland and boring even. But if that's how we think, we've just got to resist that way of thinking. Because actually what Paul has to say here on appointing elders is deeply connected to this overarching purpose and plan and strategy of Paul to reach even Crete for Christ. Deeply connected, and we'll see that in coming weeks. But with that in mind, let's think then about appointing elders, what they're to be like, and then why that matters really very much indeed. Firstly, appointing elders. Paul says, uh, you've got to appoint elders in every town. Looking here at verses 6 to 8. But these elders are not just anyone. Uh, they must be godly men, both at home and in the church. Uh, at home, an elder has got to be a faithful husband and a good dad. Verse 6, an elder must be blameless, faithful to his wife, a man whose children believe and are not open to the charge of being wild and disobedient. What happens in my home what goes on in my personal life is utterly irrelevant to my suitability for public office. That's what we've heard a number of times from various folk at various times. But of course, it's just not true. We know it. Because it, the truth is, if someone is a liar to his wife, an ineffective dad to his children... He's just not going to be truthful and effective in public office. So the very first question that Titus has got to ask of a, a possible candidate for eldership on Crete is, who is he at home? What's he like behind closed doors with his wife, with his children? Paul says he, he's got to be blameless. Not, not perfect, because no one is but above reproach. In other words, if a newspaper were to install secret cameras in his house looking for a scoop, uh, the worst headlines that they could write about him might be something like, husband comes home late, apologizes and does better the following week. Or father frustrated by child taking 10 minutes to put on shoes, later apologizes. It's not perfect, it's, there's, there's sin there but it's not going to sell any papers. And that's the point. An elder can't be hiding anything disgraceful or shameful, but instead has got to be living distinctly for Christ. He's got to be blameless. He's got to be a faithful husband. So the guy who's flirting and messing around with his colleague? No. He's got to be a good dad, a man whose children believe. Well, what's that about? Um, I don't think it's referring to uh, young adults or grown-up children. Who, um, I think they've got to, folk like that have got to decide for themselves whether they're going to continue to embrace uh, the faith of their parents or not. Um, rather, I think Paul here is ruling out the dad whose young kids want nothing to do with the faith because he's a, because he's a poor witness. Whose children are not open to the charge of being wild and disobedient. Uh, not saying that the kids, his kids have got to be angels. Um, all kids have got to learn obedience. It's a, it's a process. Um, they're not born angels. It would be lovely if they were, but they're not. They're born human beings, which means just like the rest of us, they have this propensity to sin. And so this is not saying elders' kids have got to be angels. Really, it's just saying that if their behavior is consistently wild and unruly, well, that may well indicate something not so great about him and his family management. A dad like that needs encouragement and help, uh, not the greater responsibility of trying to manage God's, God's household. So Paul's clear, an elder's got to be godly at home, 
That is, if he has a wife, he is to be a faithful husband. If he has children, he's got to be a good dad, a good Christian dad at home. And then in the church, he's got to be a godly leader as well. I think that's what verse 7 is getting at. Since an overseer manages God's household, he must be blameless. Again, we have that word blameless. Uh, Not overbearing, not quick-tempered, not given to drunkenness, not violent, not pursuing dishonest gain. Um, In football, uh, Sir Alex Ferguson uh, was known as the manager who gave his players the hairdryer treatment. Um, In other words, he would scream furiously at them at half-time. The false teachers in Crete, it seemed, were on another level again, even more domineering and quick-tempered bully boys throwing their weight around. We're told that they even used people to get rich. Verse 11, teaching things they ought not to teach for the sake of dishonest gain. In other words, the false teachers in Crete were no different to the prevailing culture around them. But Paul says that in the church, The elders of the church, the leaders, have got to be radically different because they're not just managing some football team. No, they're managing God's household. The church belongs to God, and so its overseers need to be godly. There's to be no hairdryer treatment here. Uh, Positively speaking, the elders are to be hospitable, verse 8, opening their home, welcoming to outsiders and strangers as well as self-controlled, upright, holy, and disciplined. A firm rein on his tongue and his keyboard. So Titus is to appoint elders who were godly, uh, both at home and in the church. But not just godly, they were also to be men who held firmly to the truth of the gospel. Verse 9, he must hold firmly to the trustworthy message as it has been taught so that he can encourage others by sound doctrine and refute those who oppose it. There's a video on YouTube, um, heart-stopping video, really, of a paraglider who takes off from a mountainside uh, without being fully connected up to his glider. He doesn't realize this. Um, In no time at all, he's flying at some hideous height and is now holding on. The only thing connecting him to his glider is his hand grip. He is gripping onto that pole for dear life, uh, not loosening for a moment. If he lets go, he's going to fall to his death. Now, he gets down safely. He's okay. But boy, does he hold on so very, very tightly, holding on for dear life. That is to be the picture of the elder's grip on the trustworthy message, holding firmly to the truth of the gospel for their own sake, for the sake of the church, holding on to that message tightly, a rock-solid grip, because their lives and the lives of the church depend on it. What does that mean for an elder to hold firmly to the trustworthy message? If that's the picture, what does it mean? Well, it means that they're deeply persuaded that the gospel is true in this apostolic message. Their minds are settled on it, and they've no intention or desire to move away from it. Meaning that they're then able to encourage others by sound doctrine, so that when someone needs spiritual encouragement, as we all do, he's able to speak the truth with integrity and conviction, holding firmly to the truth of the gospel. And just to be clear, um, Paul is absolutely insistent on this. This is not optional. Again, verse 5, Paul says to Titus, The reason I left you in Crete was that you might uh, put in order what was left unfinished and appoint elders in every town as I directed you. In other words, he says uh, to Titus, um, like I told you before, this is your job here. This has got to be number one on your to-do list. Appoint elders who are godly and gospel faithful. Likewise, he insists that these men be godly and that they they hold to the truth. 
Paul doesn't say, um, look, Titus, if, if, if you're able to find um, men like this, that, that's ideal, but, you know, have a go, see, see who's out there and see how you get on. No, Paul is insistent. Verse 6, an elder must be blameless. Verse 7, he must be blameless. Verse 8, he must be hospitable. Verse 9, he must hold firmly to the trustworthy message. But why is Paul so insistent? Um, why does this matter so very, very much? Uh, why should we take Paul's teaching seriously in our context today? Uh, godly elders who are gospel faithful. Why so important? Well, two reasons I think we get, we get here. Uh, because of the power of example and because of the threat of false teaching. Firstly, because of the power of example. Now, if you were blissfully unaware of this, I'm sorry for bringing this to your attention, but we are into Six, Na Six Nations Rugby Championship season um, these days. England, Ireland, Scotland, Wales, France and, and Italy. And if you're not into it, I'm afraid it's going to be in your news cycle for about six weeks. It's going to run and run. But with rugby, as with any team sport, one of the most important decisions a coach has, to, has got to take is to do with leadership and captaincy. Who is it that will get to wear the captain's armband? A really important decision. Because if a coach chooses a good, camp, good captain who's going to lead by example, well, what's going to happen? The rest of the team is going to copy their courage and their discipline, their work rate. But if a coach makes a bad decision and chooses a captain who sets a poor example, ill-disciplined, lazy, selfish perhaps, what's going to happen to the rest of the team? The rest of the team are going to follow. All of these coaches on these national teams recognize the power of example, whether good or bad. And likewise, the power of example applies to the church too. Church elders have got to be godly because they're examples to the church. In chapter 2, Paul's going to tell Titus and the elders to teach the church to be godly. He's going to uh, tell Titus to instruct the young men to be self-disciplined, to instruct the older women not to slander, and other groups as well. But of course, unless those elders are themselves godly, all of that teaching is just going to fall on deaf ears. To teach godliness effectively, elders have got to exemplify it themselves. So Paul says we need elders who are godly, who are gospel faithful. Because the church will end up copying them. And that is whether they are good or bad. The power of example Secondly, why do we need to take Paul's teaching seriously in our context today? Secondly, because of the threat of false teaching. And that's really what verses 10 to 16 are getting at. Paul said in verses 5 to 9, appoint godly, gospel, faithful elders. Why? Well, verse 10 begins, for, that is, because... In other words, here's the reason why you've got to appoint godly, gospel, faithful elders... Verse, verse 10, for there are many rebellious people full of meaningless talk and deception, especially those of the circumcision group. Uh, false teachers who had infiltrated the young churches, the threat of false teaching. Now we might think to ourselves, uh, look, what, what's the big deal about false teaching? Uh, so what if some people think differently on some aspect of the gospel. Uh, they're into circumcision and Jewish myths. I'm not. But hey, they, they still claim to know God. So what's the problem? Paul says the problem is that false teaching leads to ungodliness. Just as it's the truth that leads to godliness, believing falsehood leads to ungodliness. In other words, false teaching is corrupting and polluting. You see that verse 11. Uh, by teaching things they ought not to teach, we're told that these false teachers are disrupting whole households. Falsehood leads to ungodliness. 
uh, through their teaching, uh, they lead people into sin, verse 15, corrupting minds and consciences. Again, falsehood leads to ungodliness. Verse 16, by their teaching, these false teachers render people unfit for doing anything good. Falsehood leads to ungodliness. So rather than radically transforming Crete, these false teachers with their false teaching are simply polluting the place with even more evil. Because, of course, as we were thinking about last week, what we think and believe inside shapes how we live. What are Titus and his elders to do about these false teachers? Verse 9, they're to refute them. Verse 11, silence them. Verse 13, rebuke them sh sharply so that instead they might be sound in the faith. So stage one of Paul's great strategy and plan for reaching Crete for Christ, appoint godly and gospel faithful elders uh, because of the power of example and because of the threat of false teaching. Well, what lessons does this teach us in our context. Uh, let me just outline three for us. Uh, firstly, uh, for the sake of the health, the safety, the expansion of the church, uh, we've got to prize godliness and gospel faithfulness in our elders. We've got to prize godliness and gospel faithfulness in our elders. Um, so often it's uh, people with charisma and charm and humor and presence and appearance who catch our eye. Um, certainly as a society, those are the qualities that uh, we, we're captivated by. And those things aren't necessarily wrong. It's just that when it comes to elders, uh, these things are really completely insignificant next to godliness and gospel faithfulness. Those are the qualities we need to prize in our elders. The dramatic fall of some Christian leaders in recent years, I think, has perhaps highlighted, highlighted a, uh, that as a consistency, we've at points overvalued charisma and gifting at more than godliness and gospel faithfulness. That leaves us very weak and vulnerable. As you think of the elders here at Spicer Street, will you please continue to pray for us and encourage us in, in these things, gospel heartedness, gospel faithfulness and godliness. These are the things that really matter for the sake of the church, for the sake of society. So prize these qualities in elders. Secondly, I think this counsels us to, be, to beware trying to go it alone in the faith. Beware trying to go it alone in the faith. Um, I don't really have a church. Um, I prefer to just think about me and God, someone might say. And I guess maybe even to some, even this evening, that kind of approach might appeal but actually, given what we've seen here about the threat and effects of false teaching, uh, the disconnected Christian, the, the churchless Christian, is in fact extremely vulnerable. With no godly examples to follow, with no one to, to fend off false teaching for them, no one to encourage them in sound doctrine, they're vulnerable. It's a bit like the young, lone wildebeest who, for whatever reason, decides to separate itself from the rest of the herd. Um, with that, you watch it on the, you know, a nature program. With that decision, right in that moment, his life expectancy drops dramatically. It is now only a matter of, a short matter of time before he either starves to death or gets picked off by a predator. Likewise, the churchless Christian the disconnected Christian stands very little chance of lasting any time at all because of the threat of false teaching, because of the need for godly example. We need church. We need godly and gospel faithful elders. So please, if you're thinking of it, don't 
go it alone. And thirdly, and finally, where we do see godliness and gospel faithfulness in elders, the right thing to do is to copy them. Paul's strategy for transforming Crete, um, we see in chapter 1, it's about transformed elders, uh, leading to a transformed church, chapter 2, a church which adorns the truth, leading to a transformed society. In other words, part of the point of having godly elders is that the church might follow suit. So when we see an elder being godly or elders being godly, perhaps prayerfulness, perhaps in parenting, perhaps in truthfulness or courage or whatever sphere it's in, we're not to think to ourselves, oh, I could never be like that. We're to think to ourselves, I'd love to be like that. And then let the truth of the gospel get to work on our hearts to transform us. And we're not to think, oh, I'm so relieved that we've got um, godly, gospel, faithful elders to take the pressure off me from having to raise my game. No, we're not to think like that. We're to think, I'd love to be like that. And then letting the truth of the gospel get to work in our hearts to transform us. So that together we might be a transformed church, adorning the truth which can transform our whole society for Christ, reaching even Crete for Christ. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we do thank you indeed for the wonderful truth of the gospel which transforms. We do pray for uh, churches all across the country. We pray for those who are elders. We pray that they might be godly. We pray that they might hold firmly, grip tightly to the trustworthy message as it has been taught. And we pray that for the health of the church, the safety of the church. And we pray that so that our society might even be reached with the truth of the gospel. So we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, we're going to sing as we close, reminding ourselves of the, tr the trustworthy message, the truth that transforms. We're going to sing Amazing Grace. We'll stand when the music starts. Thank you.
final prayer as we stand. May God himself, the God of peace, sanctify us through and through. May our whole spirit, soul, and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.